And welcome to another edition of Sanctified Reason. Sanctified Reason is a podcast where Dan Delzell and myself, Son Edom, talk about the things that go on in this world through a biblical perspective. And you know, Dan, we recently talked about uh, religious rituals and, and the type of things that people do to kind of celebrate or to commemorate or to participate in their religion. For example, it could be communion, it could be baptism, it could be a number of things. And so what I thought we could do this time is that we're moving into or getting closer to the Easter season. And a lot of people equate the beginning of kind of that Easter season with Lent, with Ash Wednesday, with Fat Tuesday, which equals Mardi Gras in places like New Orleans. And so I thought that might be something we can kind of talk about is start off with a conversation about Lent, Ash Wednesday, maybe for those people that might not understand what Ash Wednesday is, maybe we can touch on that a little bit and then kind of delve into the conversation from that starting point. Sure, Son. It's definitely something that, uh, you know, there are a lot of people here in our country who uh, seem to have an interest in participating in some of the the rituals of, of Lent. You know, uh, there were multiple people in the media, I noticed, who uh, yesterday, you know, had the ashes on their forehead and so forth. And so um, it definitely seems to be part of the culture. And certainly it's, it's something that um, different churches participate in. And so, yeah, I think it can definitely open up a discussion to uh, just to some helpful spiritual practices that, um, that the Christians seek to make part of their life, you know, during this time of the year and really year round. You know, one of the things that I always find interesting, well, first off, I never really participated in Ash Wednesday. And so every year, um, I really don't think about Ash Wednesday. I don't think about uh, Mardi Gras too much. I just never really was a part of my, uh, you know, Christian culture growing up. So I'm reminded when I walk into, whether it's be a place of business, a school, just out in the community, and I start seeing people with this smudge on their forehead, I start to think to myself, oh, they then shower this morning, and then it's like, oh, that's right, it's Ash Wednesday, it's the you know beginning of Lent, and we kind of go from there. And the other thing that I find interesting is that, for some reason, Lent has become a season. Well, I guess starting off, Lent basically is, um, I guess, the beginning of like repentance, maybe uh, fasting, maybe kind of preparing ourselves, I would imagine, for the Easter season, Palm Sunday, Easter Sunday, and remembering what Jesus did on the cross. Um, but I always find it fascinating with much of the Christian culture that the world kind of takes it and kind of uses it for itself. What do I mean by that? Well, for Easter, we have an Easter bunny, which has nothing to do with, you know, Easter or any type of Christian religion or any religion for that matter. You have Easter eggs. And so, you know, Easter becomes this kind of capitalistic or this culturalistic thing of an alternative to the theology of Easter and one of those things that involves Lent is giving up something for the 40 days. And so it's starting to hit on social media this year, people giving up stuff. Someone put on social media, uh, what are you giving up for Lent? I'm giving up soda. And then others are, you know, responding with whatever they're giving up, French fries or some frivolous things. I remember one time a pastor, it was a Lutheran church, and the pastor was going to ask us, what we were giving up for Lent. And, you know, people were trying to come up with some, you know, kind of Christian-y theological things for um, giving up for Lent. And so when it came my turn, he asked me what I was giving up for Lent. And again, I'm never one that participated in the kind of the giving up of anything for Lent. So I kind of said, I'm giving up church. Well, I don't think he like took the joke uh, very well. <laughs> yeah. but, yep. um, but, it, but it's like, what did we go to or how did it come about that? You know, we give up something like soda or French fries and that's supposed to be something that's like a big theological thing or a big Christian thing for the season of Lent. I just find that kind of very odd and bizarre and kind of a worldly perspective on the whole season of Lent. Yeah, it, it's very interesting, Son, what some Christians choose to do in the exercise of their Christian freedom, what I mean by that is um, you have some churches and some Christians that will place a lot of emphasis upon Ash Wednesday and the, uh, the days of Lent, and then it, it often then has, like you say, it's kind of um, become a time when 
when, when people think about giving something up that can aid in their uh, in, in their spiritual life. Uh, so it, 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 it's a traditional thing that has developed for some folks. And like you say, for many other Christians, in the exercise of their Christian freedom and, and, and you know, the churches they attend really don't uh, perhaps uh, say much, if anything, about it. You know, you're, you're not sinning as a church or as a Christian, um, whichever way you go. Um, there, there are different ways that, um, that the, the, the Christians will approach this. Um, churches will approach it. Uh, but I think, I think it's important that whatever a church decides to make part of its routine, and, you know, every church has have routines. I mean, you know, w- w- one of the things I, I've noticed, and I'll get back to Lent here in a sec, but one of the things I've noticed, Son, in, in recent years and, and maybe in the past couple of decades, you know, there are so many churches, um, especially larger churches, that when you um, – maybe watch their church service, the, the, the worship up in front is, is generally led by people, you know, center stage. And in some cases, you know, you, you have a situation that's uh, developed and evolved where they're the main ones singing. Um, you you kind of wonder about congregational singing and, and, and so that is a development for good or bad, where it's almost like you have a little bit of a Christian concert there as part of the Sunday morning experience. Now, I, I'm not I'm not saying that that's you know good or bad. I'm just saying that that's that's something that has become a routine, especially in larger churches. Um, and you know, I think the whole point of congregational worship is intended for people to sing from their hearts to the Lord. And, and having worship leaders assist in that can be a very beneficial thing. But when you look at, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of people, and if you don't see many people really singing from their heart to the Lord, being led to do that, you know, it, it's almost like this idea like, well, you know, we pay the pastor to do the ministry rather than, God calls all Christians to minister with the gifts he's given us. I almost get the feeling sometimes, and thankfully not in, you know, uh, not in all, you know, larger churches for sure, but sometimes I get the sense that people maybe think, well, they're the ones up there doing the singing. Well, we're supposed to just kind of listen and, and be blessed. And especially if it's a song that's not, you know, easy to, to maybe sing along with. So, not not to go off on a tangent there, but the reason I mention that is every church, and this goes for Lent and, and you know, what you do during that part of the, the season, you know, um, every church in their Christian freedom gets to decide what do we feel will be beneficial for the Christians in our church to grow in their faith, to worship the Lord. Um, this Sunday or these next number of months. Um, and, you know, son, I mean, some, some churches are so liturgical that, I mean, you know, they'll have special events during the church year that go way beyond just Lent, but, but, but they celebrate, you know, various, uh, various um, events in the Bible. You know, there'll be for some churches, a, an Epiphany Sunday. And, um, you know, and, and then they'll have a, you know, Christ the King Sunday. And, and then, you know, but it, it, there's just really no end to the traditional, I would say, rituals that some churches employ. Now, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, in your Christian freedom, you're not sinning if you follow a very regimented liturgical approach, nor are you sinning. If you go with something that is just um, non-liturgical, that's not, you know, high church, as it were, Um, you know, Lent, you know, falls into that idea that, you know, we're going to we're going to follow a pattern of the church here. Now, now, just about all Christians, son, you know, seem to observe, you know, Easter and Christmas. 
Uh, beyond that, there are a lot of churches that don't really focus, uh, you know, any other Sundays on on particular things. Maybe, maybe Palm Sunday, you know, for some churches. But even that, you, you you may not have as much of a focus on that event once a year on the week before Easter, whereas other churches, you know, will. So I guess what I'm really saying is um, whether it's people. Um, observing Lent because they're choosing to do that as a church or as an individual Christian. Um, they find that that is beneficial to their spiritual life. You know, more power to anybody who, who finds that they can draw closer to the Lord in repentance and faith by doing that. Um, I mean, obviously you would, you would hope that everybody who maybe partakes in that, participates, participates in it would, would, would not just look at those 40 days, but would say, you know, what can I do to live for the Lord all year round? Um, which is where, where a lot of churches, you know, they, they don't put this emphasis just during Lent. And, and to go to your question about, you know, this idea of giving up something, um, I mean, ideally Lent is, is, is to be focused on what the Lord gave up for us. Um, you know, what, what, what he did um, in, in giving his life for us. And so, so it's that focus then, son, that, um, you know, really is what energizes, you know, I'll give you an example. So last night we had an amazing Bible study and it happened to be on Ash Wednesday, but, um, we've been going through the, uh, the, uh, the seven letters that Jesus wrote to the churches, uh, in Revelation there in Asia Minor. And seven real congregations in what is today modern-day Turkey. But anyway, we were up to the last one, the church in Laodicea. Now, no one last night, including myself, mentioned anything about Ash Wednesday. We didn't have ashes put on anybody's forehead. It's not a sin to do that. It's not a sin to focus on like what we did last night in this amazing Bible study we had um, where, boy, did the gospel ever boy, did the gospel ever get articulated so clearly through that letter to Laodicea. You know, it was interesting, Son, I, I actually, um, we had so many good things being discussed last night, but I, I remembered an email I had this past week from a young man named Kevin who wrote to me and said that he had read the article I wrote about Lordship Salvation. And uh, it was actually entitled Sifting Through Lordship, or Sifting Lordship Salvation and Free Grace Theology Through Scripture was the title of it. But anyway, I was so thankful to get his email because he talked about how God used that article to set him free from bondage. Um, and, and after reading it and, and being strengthened in the gospel by it, he said, you know, it, it really has now given him an assurance of his salvation that he didn't have because he was falling into um, this legalistic idea of works righteousness, which um, many people have been tripped up by when they when they look at that that idea of lordship salvation and 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 and, and if they if they look at that and they think well you know unless I make Jesus the Lord of every area of my life all the time maybe I'm not safe rather than looking at it as though um, you know we all we all fall short and a believer is someone who repents of their sin and believes the good news and seeks to do the Lord's will, um, but, but it, you, you don't find your assurance of salvation in trying to find perfection in every area of your life, or even any area of your life, for that matter. You know, so the whole idea of Lordship Salvation, which was promoted, you know, several decades ago, but it's been around, um, is, is that, well, you know, you're not really a Christian unless you make Jesus your Lord. Well, who wouldn't agree, Son, that every believer has accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord? But but Jesus being your Lord, that's that's part of sanctification. That's part of the, the growing that we do. That's a process. And justification is complete at conversion, but sanctification is always incomplete. So anyway, that was just one of the many things that that, that came out last night. And I was so blessed. We had a, a gentleman there who I've been talking to a lot in uh, in recent weeks and it was so great to have him there and him him share things but where i'm going with that son is that here was a case i don't know that we had uh, a more 
spirit-filled Bible study that just celebrated the gospel that the, that the church in Laodicea was lacking um, than last night, and it happened to fall on Ash Wednesday. Now, um, you know, for other people, their experience last night or yesterday Sunday would have been a focus on, you know, what Ash Wednesday represents and upon repentance and upon entering the Lenten season. And that's all fine for those that find that to, to be beneficial. But you're, you're not sinning if you observe that. You're not sinning if you, um, if you choose to focus on, or if you're led to focus on some other things uh, at this particular time. And, and, and so um, we are free. You know, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we just have to make sure that whatever we're doing, that we're not just jumping through a hoop. Um, you know, and, and you know, it's interesting, so I'll just throw this out. I mean, it's interesting to me that I, and I won't even say who it was, but I, I noticed several people who in many ways probably felt like they were bearing good witness for Christ by having the ashes on their forehead all day, including when they were on TV, and that's all well and good. But the thing that's interesting to me about that, and that's fine, um, but the people that I saw, the two or three people that I saw with that were people that have never once in the many, many hours that they've been on TV ever heard them make reference to their faith. So I guess it, it just kind of makes you wonder, um, you know, if you're going to have ashes and that's going to help your own spiritual life, um, I don't know. It's just an interest to me. It's an interesting thing that someone who never in any way even hints that they're a follower of Christ would now all of a sudden on this day show up on TV with this, this black, you know, mark on your forehead. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only one that finds that somewhat uh, interesting. Um, and I'm not quite sure what to make of that, but you know, Hey, that's not to judge anybody. And if they're led to do that and if they feel like, you know, that's their way to, um, you know, uh, you know, but I, but I can see son where if somebody has no clue about Christianity. They might think, well, that what it needs to be a Christian. You know, um, I've never heard this person say anything about Christianity. Um, I've only heard them talk about politics. I've never heard them talk about Christ. And now on this particular day, they have this black mark on their forehead. What's that all about? So I, I could see where it could be confusing to some people. And, you know, um, maybe maybe those folks took that opportunity to share the gospel. I, I, I don't know, you know. See, now that you mentioned that, that's where my comments from the beginning of the show, I was kind of beating around it. Because that's why I saw it. I saw it on TV. And I thought to myself, what's that on his head? And I'm like, oh, wait. Oh, that's right, Ash Wednesday. And that's why I was saying, I see it on community or whatever. I didn't want to go right to the point, but that was the point. That's exactly where I saw it was on TV. And I started thinking to myself, and that's what, why I want to kind of have this conversation because Mm -hmm. you see it out there like that and you see it from people. And I don't know who these people are. I don't know, you know, anybody who has uh, an ash uh, cross on their forehead. I don't know anything you know about them if I see them. So I don't know what their faith is like, but you know, when you think about it, okay, yeah, you've got this 40 day period. Okay. So maybe it's, it's a, um, it's, I don't want to say a a theological thing yet. Maybe it's a religious thing on the calendar that's, that designates these 40 days. And then it's become a ritual and there's become something that becomes ritualistic that because to me, to be honest, um, you know, someone told me once it had to do with something like, you know, uh, when Jesus said, you know, take up your cross daily or deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me, that was kind of one of mm-hmm. the springboards into, you know, giving up something for Lent because you're, you're denying mm-hmm. yourself. Okay, I don't see how, mm-hmm. well, first of all, we're supposed to do it every day all year round because the Bible says yeah. do it daily, not yeah. like for 40 days. And then the other thing, right. too, was um, I honestly, again, and, and I know you, you've made the statement, so um, whatever people felt called and led to do is fine. But just for the sake yeah. of conversation, I find it completely juvenile and irrelevant that you give up soda because Jesus died on the cross and the yeah. agony of dying on the cross. I think giving up soda is kind of irreverent, uh-huh. uh, ir- irreverent to the fact of what Jesus uh-huh. did. And that's just me, um, you know, candy, yeah. television, yeah. whatever. I just think that's ir- uh, like it says, it, yeah. It, it, yeah. it belittles what Jesus did on the cross. And we should have uh-huh. that every single day, not just for the 40 day period. Yeah. And then we also have to make sure that if we're going to have that cross on our forehead for one day, we need to make sure that we are acting as if we have that cross on the forehead 
every single day. Yeah. And you know, another thought, Tom, yes, I think those are great points. Um, the thought that came to my mind when you mentioned that about someone refraining from, let's say, soda, it makes me think of how in, in the Bible, Son, you know, there were very uh, spiritual, godly examples of people who would fast and pray. And, um, and, and many times when we, when we do find this in the Old Testament or the New Testament, um, it was being done. It was, it was a refraining from um, you know, your physical needs because your spiritual hunger for God and for living for God and for seeking the Lord's will it is so great that you're, you're wanting to just refrain from that so you can devote more of your focus to prayer. And, and many people, Son, have, have talked about and written about the benefits that they have, have found in their own life when they've chosen to freely do that, not in some legalistic way, not you know, being forced to do that. But, you know, for some people, it might be, you know, skipping a meal or going all day um, without, you know, food just to have more time in prayer and just to just to pray and fast, which is a biblical practice. But my point is, or some obviously even longer than a day, but um, multiple days, etc. cetera. Um, my, my point is that, you know, I suppose for some people, that may be, of course, how some Christians uh, look at, their own personal piety during Lent, where for them, um, they find that fasting from maybe one item, you know, uh, but the, the thing, of course, that a person has to be careful of is, is that we don't somehow think that, well, now somehow we're earning God's grace because we're, we're fasting from TV or we're fasting from soda or we're fasting from coffee or, or whatever. Um, but it, it's all about God's grace, and, and if a person finds that he or she is able to be more focused on, on higher things, nobler things, spiritual things, by refraining from something, um, then, then that's fine. But, you know, the, the other thing that's interesting about it, Son, I think you're kind of alluding to this, is it's like, why do we need to know what anybody else might be choosing to refrain from? I mean... Why would any Christian want someone else to know that? I, you know, it would be very hard for our flesh to not take some pride in that or some, you know, kind of like, wow, you know, I'm really, I'm really going the extra mile you know, for the Lord very glad. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're not to go around and broadcast our own um, personal decisions about how we're seeking to be closer to God because, you know, many people will, will then be, you know, maybe be tempted to want to somehow give us credit for it. And, and that's not what the Lord, you know, the, the, the Bible says, you know, that, that we're to, you know, if, we're, if we want to do sometimes something like this, we want to pray and fast. I mean, go into your closet and pray. And, and the Lord even says what is done in secret, God will reward you in the open. But, but, but the, you know, the example in the Bible of somebody doing things that people knew about were the Pharisees. In fact, Jesus even said, you know, he pointed to their, to their tithing and their fasting um, that everybody knew about because they made sure everybody knew about it, but they neglected the, the weightier matters of the law. Their hearts weren't right. They were hypocrites, many of them. So there was an example, Son, where they were, they were even refraining on, on certain days. You know, they'd have a little ritual, um, and, and they, would, they would do their little fast, and they would give their money. But you know what, Son? It didn't mean a thing to the Lord because you can give money and and you can fast. Uh, but if your heart's not right, I mean, I'll tell you, Son. That's that's one of the many reasons why I'm so thankful. Um, at, at the church I pastor at Redeemer, from day one, we've not passed the offering plate, and and you know we have an offering basket in the back, and, and those who are led to give, you know. But. Um, you know, we don't want we we don't want it to be about money. We don't want it to be about. Uh, I mean, there's so many people who have been burned in in churches. Um, in, in fact, oh my goodness, this is crazy. So I, I went in son for my yearly physical here a couple weeks ago, and a wonderful nurse who was uh, uh, like taking my blood pressure and stuff that day. Um, uh, relatively, or new, they're, they're newer. She and her husband are newer to this area from Georgia. But anyway, I couldn't believe it. She told me about, well, I was telling her about, you know, our, 
our church. And then I, you know, invited her and everything, had a good talk and uh, gave her some information about, you know, when we meet and everything. But, um, but she told me, um, she said, they tried a church here in Omaha. And I won't mention the church. The church I'm aware of in, in Omaha, it's in Omaha, um, basically in North Omaha. And she said they had no more than walked in the door. But somebody was asking, like, for their check, either their, I think she said check stub, but maybe she meant their, their, something to do with their checking account. Apparently, maybe, 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 maybe they wanted their, you know, their, their, uh, you know, like, if you're going to get hired by somebody or, or no, I'm sorry, if you're going to apply for a loan, maybe somewhere they want to see, like, your, your, uh, your tax statement or something. But uh, they'd walk in the door and somebody's asking them, somebody with the church is asking them, you know, for their, for their, uh, checking information or, or salary information or something. I mean, they sat there through a couple of songs. They got up and left. I've never heard it, but being that blatant, I mean, I, I could hardly believe it. Um, I, I have heard over the years, son, especially years ago, there, there've been some churches that have been so focused on the money that, that they want people to give that, that it, it even used to be a case on in some churches, they would post, they would post what everybody gives during the year. Oh my goodness. I mean, you, you talk about inviting somebody to compromise their, 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 their motives. And, and, um, but I mean, I could hardly believe that, but in this day and age here, this, this, this woman's telling me that they went to that church and you know, they're, they're hitting them up for something to do with their checkbook or their, I don't know what it was, but she said they were so turned off. And so I told her, I said, well, Hey, I mean, we'd love to have you you know, come and, and, and visit Redeemer. I said, uh, just know that we, we've never passed an offering basket. You know, we never will um, because, you know, that should not become what the, the you know, what, what people are hearing when they, they need to hear the gospel. And I tell you, Sot, um, you know, nearly 32 years as a pastor, uh, I've never seen where there's been a lack for what's needed. Um, God's always provided by, you know, by not harping on people uh, about that, letting them be led by the Lord, um, led by the Holy Spirit. And, but, but again, I go back to the Pharisees, you know, they, they were tithing, but they were hypocrites. Um, they were tithing, but they were hypocrites. They were fasting, but they were hypocrites. Um, they were not believers. You know, it's like the church in Laodicea, where Jesus said they were lukewarm and he was about to spit them out of his mouth. They didn't know the gospel. Um, they, they were not, they, they were not trusting in Christ as Savior, because if they were, they would not have been lukewarm. You know, like I told our folks last night, Don, I said, hey, uh, I said, I'm not aware of one lukewarm person at Redeemer, but I said, it would be hard to be lukewarm at Redeemer because, you know, by God's grace, you know, we're, we're proclaiming the word and, and the gospel very, very clearly every Sunday. And the only people who are going to want to stick around for that are, are those who are going to tend to, you know, start to get on fire for that. And if you don't want that, if you want, you know, other things like in Laodicea, you know, they were very wealthy. Um, in fact, the Lord said to them, you say I am rich, um, but you do not realize that you were wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. So they had material wealth there in that city in Laodicea. Um, it's interesting, son, because underneath that city, the water would flow from an aqueduct. And the people of that city knew that if they were to, to drink some tepid water, from underneath the city, it would be, it would be like be nauseous, and and they would uh, feel nauseous, and they would like spit it out. And so when the Lord said to them, "I'm about to spit you out of my mouth," He was giving them a very vivid illustration that your religion, your rituals, you know, you think you've got it together. You think that you're, you know, kind of like these churches today, son. That um, you know, they're they're so lost in terms of the gospel. And, 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 and one reason you know they've lost the gospel is because they're teaching things like, well, there, there've got to be many ways to get to God. And, and we're not so sure about the virgin birth. And, you know, Jesus probably sinned when he was on earth. And, uh, you know, that resurrection stuff. And we don't know about that. You know, we don't know about heaven and hell. But those are all spokes to the hub. The hub of the wheel is justification by faith. Um, justification by faith. And that's what the Laodiceans did not understand. They, they weren't hearing the gospel. Um, so I don't know what their pastor was preaching, but uh, the fact that there were still people in that church suggests to me he wasn't preaching the gospel. 
Because if he had, they would, they would not have wanted to have been part of that. Because the gospel, it humbles a person. Um, you have to let, let, you know, let the Lord basically strip you spiritually naked to the point where you'll come to God as, as a beggar um, and, and knowing that you can only be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Whereas the Pharisees, they went to God very proud, very self-righteous. And this is what the Laodiceans were. They were self-righteous. So all of this we're talking about today, son, it fits into this, this issue that you, you're, you're raising today of Lent because it all fits with, you know, you can go through rituals and that can be fine. I mean, traditions, rituals, um, whether you have a, a, a worship team up in front, you know, doing most of the singing and the congregation not singing much, whether it kind of feels like a concert maybe during those times. I mean, well, as long as people's hearts, I guess, are, are they hearing the gospel? That, that's the thing, son. Are people hearing the gospel or are we just tickling ears with a feel good message um, that's kind of more holistic and maybe we give people principles on how to have a better life or a better marriage or better finances. But are we preaching the gospel? Are we preaching the word? Because that's the only way the fire of the Holy Spirit is going to show up. That's the only way a soul is going to be saved. That's the only way a person then is going to not be lukewarm and not be, you know, going off on all sorts of false doctrine. But but they're going to be grounded in the gospel, which is, um, you know, which is the greatest message. And, you know, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. So um, we've got the greatest message in the world, and we just have to stay focused on that and then proclaiming the whole counsel of God. But if we don't have the gospel, son, um, you can have rituals. You, you can have, uh, um, you know, things going on in your church. You can have money. You can have buildings. You can have, you know, even, even large numbers of people. But without the gospel, you have nothing uh, because you won't have Christ. You won't have the Holy Spirit. Um, and, um, you know, that's why the Lord died. So we, could, so we could be given salvation, and that's the gospel, John three sixteen. And, and these other things are fine. If somebody in their Christian freedom, you know, wants to celebrate Ash Wednesday, more power to you or let more power to you. But don't assume that everybody's going to follow your particular form of piety. And, and if you don't, if you're not led to do that, don't assume that there won't be some people who are led to do it. But, but the key is the heart, the heart. And that's where the Pharisees went astray. And Jesus said, these people um, worship me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. So it, it's not about whether we can show people that we got some ashes on our forehead. It's, um, you know, do they see in our life a life of justice and righteousness and truth and compassion and love? And do they, do they hear from us the message of the gospel or do they just hear kind of a moralistic, um, religious kind of a thing? where as long as you jump through the right religious hoops, like the Pharisees were doing, you'll be okay. Well, no, we know that, as Jesus said, that, that's not, you, you, you're you not okay uh, apart from the gospel. You know, Dan, you mentioned um, the people that you were talking to going to the church and then right away money becoming an issue. Um, that's a big problem in the church because there was a story when I was working with the Frank Sontag show, which was a Christian talk show in Los Angeles. There was a, a Babylon B, that's the satire, you know, website. Um, they posted a headline that said mega church offering prime parking for their highest givers. And the story mm-hmm. was basically satirical on the fact that the more people gave to the church, the better their parking spot was going to be. And they were going to have like a designated like parking spot for the top giver of the month. So I thought it'd be a good idea. So I talked with Frank, and we thought we'd run it as like a real story, see if people would buy into it, because it was completely you know, outrageous as the story was yeah. written, because it's satire. It was over-the-top satire. But we thought, you yeah. know what, we'll, 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 let's go with it, and let's see if people, and then we right. see if people you know, call, it, call our bluff, so to speak. So yeah. we ran the story as real. We took phone calls. People were calling in, and they were like you know, emotional about it, you know, 
from all spectrum. Some thought it was okay. Some thought it was, you know, a bad thing for this mega church, you know, this nondescript mega church. And so the conversation went back and forth and everybody had all kinds of opinions on it. And then finally we did get one caller that I guess had seen it on the, the Babylon Bee. And so we allowed them to come on and expose it as, you know, satire from that website. And so, but, but here's the point. Okay. The point was that even though it was over the top satire, Okay, and and completely ridiculous that a church would offer prime parking for their top, you know, uh, tithers. People, right. it was believable. That was the sad thing. It was believable that a church yeah. would do that, and that's where we've gotten in this world. That's why when it comes to things like Lent, where you're going to put an ash in your forehead and give up soda or coffee or donuts or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. we've gotten mm-hmm. to the point where the bizarre has become accepted and true. In society, you know, so yeah, when people see a money thing with the church, that's, that's a real thing because people believe that I've told the story before, you know, John 14, six, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the father except by me. And so we had a conversation on that same radio show. Is there any other way to heaven? And people would swear up and down on the Bible that they were lifelong Christians, you know, born and bred in the church, baptized 800 times and all that stuff, and say that, yes, there is another way to get to heaven besides Jesus. And it's just, you know, crazy to think that, you know, as we think about sanctified reason, we think about looking at the things of this world through a biblical perspective, that you you get to a place where the Bible is completely you know, I don't know if it's misrepresented, misunderstood, uh, bastardized, whatever the case may be, but people take the, the Bible and they create these worldly conflicts with it and they put the emphasis and the focus on that because, like you said, if we're going to deal do with a 40-day period of, okay, reflection, uh, maybe fasting, uh, maybe, mm-hmm. you know, self-sacrifice, you know, some of these things. Now, I can understand that people might utilize these calendar events um, as dates sure. for doing that, you know, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. use Easter. I'm going to use maybe, uh, the Christmas time, right. you know, maybe Thanksgiving, you know, whatever they have different, you know, times throughout the year that they follow the religious calendar yeah. and, and make these things. Yeah. But then it also becomes so like ridiculous because if you, even if you just scroll through social media, you know, you've got people out there saying, what do you give up for Lent? And it's just all kinds of ridiculous nonsense. I mean, things that are even well beyond, you know, the sodas yeah. and the candies, yeah. you know, it's, it's just ridiculous stuff. And then you get into things that you can't give up. Like I was reading um, on a on a thread that seemed to be a little bit more theological than just you know nonsense, and people were like saying I'm giving up stress, I'm giving up sin, I'm giving up you know lustful thoughts. It's like these are things that you can't give up by yourself. Yeah. These are things you yeah. can't, and that's the thing. So if you're if you're going to take this period of time, which is fine and that's great, but yeah. there's nothing sure. you can do. On your own. And again, it goes back to self. You know, these, you, you're taking Lent and you're taking the very purpose and you're kind of mixing right. it up saying that I'm going to do this for Jesus. Well, you can't do anything for Jesus. Yes. It's backwards. Right. right. Yes, son. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's only when we are concentrating on what he did for us that we receive the forgiveness through faith in Christ and then the power of the Holy Spirit to say no to temptation and to what Titus calls, um, you know, ungodly desires. Um, so, so it's Christ in us. And, you know, as far as, you know, as, as far as people, you know, saying, Hey, I'm a Christian, but there are many ways to get to God. Just the most basic understanding of the gospel son tells us that as Paul wrote in Galatians three, verse 10, all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. The gospel is good news for sinners because it's the only way that a sinner can be declared righteous in God's eyes. So in our study last night, uh, in the letter that Jesus gave to the church in Laodicea, he said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire and white clothes to wear to cover your shameful nakedness and sad to put on your eyes so you can see. Now, now, son, these white clothes, this is the righteousness of Christ. This is not, well, you know, I'm giving up something, so I guess my robe's a little bit whiter now than, than it was. That That's all works righteousness. That is all the law. 
Um, and, and, and if a person, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with giving things up. I mean, especially if we're, you know, um, indulging in things that we need to give up. If we're indulging in sin, we definitely need to, to say, to say no to that. Um, but if we think that by giving something up, that's what's going to make us righteous, um, that's not what is going to, to make us righteous. Now, you know, there are some clear things in the Bible that, that the Lord has said. Um, these are completely off limits for Christians. I mean, there are quite a few things. Um, I mean, even some of the marks of a, of a immature Christian that Paul pointed to in Corinthians, the uh, quarreling and jealousy. He said, these folks are babes in Christ. Uh, they're not, they don't have, they, they weren't uh, mature in their faith. And the evidence of it was that they were quarreling and they were um, jealous. But the fact that they were in Christ means they were Christian. Um, it, it's kind of like those Christians who were sitting against the Lord's body and blood in, uh, in 1 Corinthians. And, and they were then judged by the Lord so they would not be condemned with the world. Um, some of them became weak and sick. Some of them even fell asleep, which is a New Testament way of saying you go to heaven. Uh, you, you, you know, those who fall asleep in Jesus are believers in Jesus. Um, but, but for, for somebody to say, Son, that there are many ways to heaven, it shows such a, just a lack of just a basic understanding uh, of what the gospel is, is about because the gospel tells us that our sin is so bad that no amount of works on our part can make up for it. No amount of giving up something for 40 days or 365 days, nothing we do can, can cover our sin. You know, um, it's like the song says, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And this then, son, when a person begins to see this message, um, and, and this is what that gold refined in the fire seems to be pointing to, um, the faith that the Laodiceans were lacking. Um, they were proud of their religious deeds, but they came up short because they were not focused on the gospel. It's interesting, son, the Lord didn't tell them, you're not doing enough, you need to do more. That's not all what he said. What he told them is you're not focused on the right stuff. You're not believing the right stuff. You're not trusting. I mean, you know, this is essentially what he was saying. You're not trusting in me to forgive you and then live through you. It's all about your little, you know, um, religious rituals. Um, you're very confident because you you have money. And, and by the way, son, you know, people who have money, it, it's such a temptation to rely on that. Um, you know, Jesus said how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven because, because riches tend to pull a person's um, focus away from the Lord. And, and that's why uh, the love of money, not money itself, but the love of money is a root of all evil. And, you know, you know going back for a second now on, on money and that tithing thing, you know, and you were talking about that, um, that example that you and Frank uh, had on the show there of just that little, um, that little story that wasn't true. Well, son, you may have read here, and it was maybe a week or so ago, and I won't mention the, the pastors. I remember one of them because he's well-known, but there were two pastors, I guess, who came out recently, and, and this seems to be a true story, son. Um, they told their congregation, or congregations, I guess, maybe a couple of different churches, they told their people that if they would tithe, God would, and, and if God did not then um, you know, return a certain amount of money to them. Uh, and maybe it was just that time that they gave. I don't know. But, it, but, it, but if they didn't, if, if they basically lost money, you know, in essence, by tithing, the church would, um, the church would, would, would give that money to them at the end of a year. Now, I thought about that. I, I'm sure from the church's and the pastor's standpoint, they thought this shows how much we believe that God is going to do this for you. But, but here's one problem with that, not, uh, among, I'm sure, many problems with it. Um, basically, then, what it's inviting people to do, Son, is this. Rather than trusting the Lord, that when you give whatever you're led to give to, to the Lord's purposes, rather than trusting the Lord to meet your needs because you just gave out of a cheerful heart, 
Now you're being invited to trust the church, to, to trust that, that they're going to repay. You know, I mean, so it, it's just that you don't ever find something like that in, in Scripture. And it was just, I don't know if you happen to see that, but that was, that really caught my attention. Um, you know, I know that they want, you know, they want to, I suppose, in their minds, teach people about giving. But, uh, hey, I, I think the Lord's, the Lord is more than big enough to take care of people. And by the way, son, I will say this about tithing. You know, um, it's an Old Testament practice, you know, in the New Testament. Um, you know, the Bible focuses on cheerful giving. In the Old Testament, they had not yet received, you know, God's son. God had not yet given his son um, for their salvation. Now he's, he's given us his son. So, I mean, you know, anything we give is, I mean, how can you compare it to what God's given? I mean, I think of Rick Warren, the pastor in California. He and his wife uh, are reverse tithers. That is, they, they made so much money on his book sales that they give away 90% of their income for ministry, you know, in the world and they're locally and keep 10%. Well, um, where I'm going with that is, you know, the Bible in the New Testament, it doesn't beat people over the head with tithing, but it has been said, son, and I, and I believe this is true. Um, you know, you, you, you cannot outgive God. And there have been many testimonies of people who have tithes and, <laughs> excuse me, uh, for whom the Lord has, provided for their needs and then continue to, to bless them so they could be a blessing to others. So, um, you know, giving, you know, God loves a cheerful giver. Um, but I just think we have to be careful how we present this message because it, it can definitely become a focus. And we know with like the, uh, the prosperity preachers, that's their, one of their biggest downfalls. I mean, they've got messed up doctrine in a number of ways, but that's one of the, of the prosperity preachers. They love money. The reason you know they love money, side, they're always talking about it. And it's not only their private jets and their mansions that they have, the, their materialism that, that they put on display, um, they wear as a badge of honor. Um, but what they're broadcasting, you know, they, they, they talk about faith, but rather than having the faith to give that away and give it to the poor, what they're broadcasting is, I love money, I love material things, look, um, so send me another $20 because I got you know, some jet fuel to, to pay for today and uh, whatever. But, um, boy, that's so far from what the Lord taught. It, it's just, it's just, you know, nuts. Yeah, it's really interesting, you know, when you start to get into kind of the, the, the season of kind of heightened religion. You know, you think about people that go to church only twice a year, and even sometimes non-believers, you know, they go to church twice a year, Christmas and Easter. And they feel like that is a time of year where it's almost like they, they feel like they're missing out if they don't go. I remember talking to a guy that uh, I don't think he was a believer because he never really led on to the fact that he was a believer and his lifestyle would indicate otherwise. But nonetheless, he made the comment to me one time because he knew I'd go to church. He said, hey, do you know where I might be able to go to uh, church on a Sunday? And so, you know, I suggested the church I was going to. And he's like, well, I don't have a car. It's a little too far. And. You know, so I'm like, hey, you want to? I'll, I'll pick you up. I'll take you. Whatever. He's like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to force the issue. So I, I gave him a couple of uh, options that were I felt were pretty decent by where he lived, and he, I don't think he ever went. But he felt this compulsion to um, go at Christmas time. Like you were missing out if you didn't go at Christmas time mm -hmm. or go to your you know, even mm -hmm. Chris, maybe a Christmas Eve service. You know, whatever candlelight vigil. Yeah. And so it seems like, you know, and then of course, Easter, obviously, for obvious reasons, uh, Easter Sunday, you, you know, people feel like they need to go, but it seems like there's an opportunity here, especially at this, this time of year, when a lot of people are focused, you know, on religion, focused on Christianity, focused on, you know, even, you know, Catholics and that side of Christianity. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like it's a really good opportunity because everyone's kind of heightened into it and everybody has it on their mind you know if it's one thing or another you know because if they are giving up something like soda every day they're going to be reminded every day of what they're doing you know and so it could be yeah. a good opportunity for for people to be able to even for those that um are giving up something that maybe aren't really true believers but they're just kind of doing it because maybe it's the thing to do it's an opportunity mm -hmm. for people to really use this time of year in the next 40 days or 46 days, you know, because I guess Lent is minus the weekends, to be able to, you know, really impact 
and, and spread the gospel or spread the message or or do something and take advantage of everybody's heightened awareness of the religious season. Because then if you start to kind of, you know, maybe plant the seed now or, or pave the way, so to speak, eventually you get into Palm Sunday and then eventually into Easter. And then once Easter hits, that next Monday, people have forgotten all about it. And it's not until yeah. Christmas before, yeah. you know, people start thinking about it again. Yeah. And, and you know, Son, what comes to my mind when I think about a situation where, let's say you have a person and they do attend uh, on Christmas and Easter and that's it. Okay. Um, you have to ask yourself, okay, so what's going on there? Um, what's their motivation? Um, and, 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 you know, let's just say, son, we had somebody that, that you and I were talking to and we just met this person and we learned, oh, so you're married. Okay, great. So where do you guys live? Well, no, I don't really live with my spouse. Oh, what, you travel a lot? No, no, it's not that. But, um, we're married, but see, um, we don't live together. Um, we don't really talk. Other than maybe, you know, there's a couple times a year we like to go out and have dinner. You know, a couple times. So it's like your friend then. No, no, this is my this is my spouse. What? What, what do you mean your spouse? Oh, you, yeah, we're married, you know. Um, that little scenario there, son, would be like a person saying, oh, no, I'm a follower of Christ. But I really don't talk to him. I I do celebrate a couple of big events, you know, his birth and his resurrection. I, I, I like to get together and celebrate that. But, it, you know, other than that, I, I'm just, I'm pretty busy, you know. So, so all I'm saying is uh, not to, you know, not to come down on, on anyone, let's say, who, who finds himself or herself in that situation, but just to help them realize that as important as uh, a marriage relationship is in terms of the time that it takes to maintain a close uh, loving marriage. How much more important is it then um, for a person if they would like to be a follower of Christ? Um, how much more important is it then to have a daily relationship with Christ? And, and in the Bible, son, you, you don't have such a thing in the New Testament as, 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 as people who are followers of Christ who are not getting together with other Christians to be a blessing and to be blessed. You just don't have it. Now, there are exceptions to that. And, you know, you might have somebody who's a homebound individual that can't get out. I mean, hey, that's totally different. Obviously, during COVID, there were there were situations there that were keeping people in. But I'm talking in, well, and then, of course, you know, in nations where there's great persecution. Um, I mean, that's a much different situation. I mean, they're believers. Um, you know, they might, I mean, I, you know, I've heard that like in North Korea, son, you know, because they'll, you know, if they find out that you're Christian or, um, I mean, it's very, very, um, difficult and dangerous to have fellowship with other believers. But if you're a Christian, you, you might, you know, go sit on a park bench on a, on a Sunday morning and hope that maybe another believer happens to sit down next to you and so you try to figure out is this a christian i can talk to or not i mean is this a christian or not or is this an undercover you know government um agent who's trying to find out whether or not i'm a christian because like in north korea you know they'll uh they will try to find out from the very young children at school if if uh maybe there's a bible in their home and i mean it could be off to the uh off to the camp uh, you know, the prison camp. If, 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 so it's a much different situation in America. But, but you know, the, the, the person who goes to church song on Christmas and Easter would be like the person who's saying, oh, yeah, I'm married, but we don't live together. We don't really talk. We go out for dinner a couple of times a year, but I'm married. And, and so th- this is what was going on in Laodicea, son. They were self-deceived. They convinced themselves that, that they were religious and they were with God. But Jesus, and by the way, this was the only one of the seven churches uh, for which Jesus did not have any words of, of um, approval. There was nothing good. You know, every, all the other churches, he had at least something good to say. In fact, the church just before that, when the church in uh, Philadelphia, uh, the letter to the church in Philadelphia, that was a small congregation. But that was one of two churches where the Lord had nothing bad to say about them, which just goes to show, son, that it's not the size of the church that determines the Lord's approval or disapproval, but it's the faith and the obedience, the love of the people in the church for God and for others. 
So what I would simply say to somebody if they're listening and say, say, well, hey, I'm one of those people who go to church Christmas and Easter. I'd say, hey, you know, I'm so thankful to hear that you have um, some uh, some history there. With, with, and hopefully it's a church where the gospel is being proclaimed. Um, but I would simply say this. Um, God would love for you to become um, a follower of his who um, gets together with other believers to be a blessing and to be blessed. And yes, people have had bad experiences in churches, like this woman I mentioned at the doctor's office, okay? But people have bad experiences in marriage. Um, but, but many of them still go on to get married again. Um, so, so this is the thing, son. Um, and, and to bring it full circle with the whole discussion of Lent and everything, it all comes back to an individual's heart. You know, Jesus gave it all on the cross. Do I want a relationship with Christ? Do I want to be forgiven of my sins? And if I do, then God says, I want to cleanse you completely through faith, not your works. And then I'm going to infuse you with my love, my power, the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I will help you then to follow me if you really want this. And I'll tell you a sign. Anybody can be as close to God as they want to be. Um, and, and, and anybody can be as distant from God as they want to be. Just like in a marriage, any spouse, you can be as close to your spouse as you want to be. And, and the same is true uh, with, with Christianity. So I would just say to go back to the Lent thing, it's not a sin if you follow a certain you know, approach with things like that. It's not a sin if you don't. But it is a sin. If we think that somehow um, our ritual or our tithing or our fasting or our giving up something, that somehow that that is gaining God's acceptance of us, when the only way, my friend, God's going to accept you is if you come completely naked spiritually. That is, don't bring any of your righteousness, because the Bible says those are like filthy rags to God. If you're relying on that to be accepted. Now, once you're saved, born again, redeemed, justified, and forgiven, once you're converted, that happens on the front end of your relationship with God through faith, not by works. Once you're converted, then your works can please God. It's just like in a marriage, okay? Once you're married, you can do a lot of things to please your spouse and make them happy and, 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 and being kind to them. And, and, but if you're not married... And you walk by somebody on the street, you might think, well, I'm doing this for this person. Well, they don't even know you. You know, you're not, you're not blessing them. And they, they don't care about what you're doing. And in a similar way, uh, a person who does not know Jesus through faith, you know, Jesus said, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. If you don't know Jesus, you know how much all those rituals are impressing God? Not one bit. In fact, they're offensive to God. People who are trying to, like, be religious like the Pharisees, but they don't, they don't have the righteousness of Christ. That is actually offensive to God because it belittles the sacrifice Jesus made. Because here's what it says in the Bible, son. If righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And that's basically what a person is saying to God when they try to come to him with their own righteousness. It's like, well, yeah, I kind of heard that your son died, but hey, um, God, here, please accept, please accept this offering I have of my, I'm giving up this and I'm giving up that, you know, and, uh, it's like, it's like Adam and Eve when they sinned and they tried to cover their shame with their fig leaves. Well, that wasn't going to get it done, you know? Um, and that's kind of what religion is on. It's just the fig leaves. And by religion, I mean, when people rely on that to be righteous with God, rather than upon what Paul writes about this righteousness from God, which comes through faith in Jesus Christ. These are the white clothes the Laodiceans were not wearing. This is the gold they did not have because they did not have faith. And yet, you'll know, hear some moralistic preachers, you know, tell their congregation, well, you need to do more. You need to do more in order to know that you're saved. But I'll tell you what, that young man, or I don't know what his age is, I guess, uh, but uh, th this gentleman who wrote to me this past week and said he was, he was, he was oppressed under this, this idea. He never, he, he could never find the assurance of his salvation. <clears throat> and by the way, son, I, uh, I had an article recently that uh, talked about um, 
Martin Luther and Saul of Tarsus and three former Catholic priests. And all three of those priests talked about how they had no assurance of salvation when they were relying upon the religion that they'd been giving. Um, but when they turned to Christ and trusted him alone, that's when they came to this assurance, knowing that they were saved by the blood of Jesus and by his cross. You know, Dan, we've unpacked a, a lot on this conversation, which is really good. But um, it just it just makes us think, too, that, you know, when we go through our daily life here on earth, it's not first off, it's not the ultimate destination. We're going to ultimately end up in heaven if we're a believer and we follow Jesus, repent of our sins. But it keeps us on our toes to remember that each and every day we need to make sure that we are an example for him, that we are, you know, making sure that we're not um, – doing something that would want to make others run like, you know, maybe the church and the, and the money thing, Hey, what's your you know paycheck, your pay stub, you know, things like that. And then it also is a reminder at this time that, you know what, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to honestly, you know, check ourselves and to see exactly how our lives are. And then to be an example and a witness and maybe use opportunities because there is a lot more going on at the church. I remember there was soup suppers at churches in past that I've been to, or maybe there was like a, a no meat Friday that people observe. So there's, there's these rituals or these things that go on at this time of year, much like the holidays that we might be able to use to invite people to come and be like, Hey, you know what? We're doing this. Doesn't really mean anything. You know, it's just like, Hey, you know what you want to, you want to come over for, you know, fish Friday or whatever. Um, you know, yeah. and people are like, Oh, they must be a no meat people. No meat, no meat Friday. But anyways, you're using an opportunity to then try to open doors in which you have an opportunity to be a witness for somebody. So that's another thing that, you know, I take from this too, besides uh, what we've talked about is anytime there's things like this that come up, it's always an opportunity for us to, you know, twist it 180 ourselves and bring it back to the Bible and bring it back to opportunity yeah. to present others with the gospel message. Yeah, it's definitely an opportunity to do that, Son. And, you know, in the Bible, no one is ever instructed to pray to someone other than to God, you know, for forgiveness. No one is ever instructed to pray to some Christian who's gone before us. No one is ever instructed to pray to um, to the mother of our Lord, Mary. You know, I mean, there's lots of religious things that get done in the world that do absolutely nothing to bring grace to a soul. All they do is they... They, they give a person a false sense of security because it's like, I jump through these hoops. I mean, going to church every Sunday can do that. If a person isn't trusting in the gospel, uh, you know, giving money, uh, fasting, all these things we pray, uh, talk about. So it does come back to um, a relationship with Christ through faith. And then, um, you know, from that, you know, um, as Paul writes in, in Romans 1.5, he talks about the obedience that comes from faith. So obedience flows out of a faith relationship with Christ, and that's obedience that pleases the Lord. Just like if a little child is going to obey mom or dad, that pleases mom and dad. Well, when a child of God obeys God, that pleases God. But if you're not a child of God, then you've not yet, you've not yet entered into that relationship whereby God will be pleased with anything you do. And that is part of the gospel message, Son, that when, when people say, well, you know, there are many ways to get to God, that they're showing that they really don't have much of a clue at all about the gospel. Because the gospel, by definition, is exclusive. What I mean by that is the gospel doesn't say, you know, God didn't say in John three sixteen, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him or in some other path, may not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus didn't say that. We are not at liberty to proclaim a message he didn't proclaim. And if we do, then we are false teachers. Um, you know, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus did not say, I am one of the ways, one of the truths out there. I am a path to life. But actually, in all honesty, there are other people who get to the Father except through me. He didn't say that. And, and so it, it's just mind-boggling to me, Son, uh, to, to go to the example you gave earlier, someone who's professing to know Christ, but then they turn around and say there must be many ways to God. 
they really need to recheck their theology because Christianity 101, just at the basic level of the gospel sign, teaches you that Jesus did not die on the cross to provide one more way to get to heaven. You know, absolutely not. He would have stayed in heaven. The Father would have never sent the Son. We already had the Ten Commandments. You know, if all we needed to do was a little bit better, are you kidding me? Jesus would never have gone through the agony of the cross. It was the only way our sin could be forgiven. And, son, that's why it's such an important part of the gospel to stress that Jesus is the only way. Because until a person sees that, how far their sin has separated from God, them from God, and how only the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross can repair that and, and cleanse you and, and put on a white robe of righteousness on your soul. Until you see that, you really don't understand the gospel. Um, at least not in the, the, the biblical uh, teaching that you need to understand to be grounded in it. Or you might have just a, you know, a very simple, well, I, you know, I, I, I believe in Jesus. Um, yeah, he, he, he's a good way. But, you know, the parable of the sower tells us that there are many people who will hear the message, but then something will take it away from them. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of wealth, um, you know, the devil will come along and steal it. So you've got to be grounded in the gospel. And 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 I'll wrap it up with this. That's why I was so thrilled last night. And it happens to fall on on a night that many people celebrate as Ash Wednesday. Great. I'm so thrilled last night, Son that the focus was not on anything anybody there was going to be giving up, other than just giving up any self-righteousness that we may possess so that we can come to the Lord naked, spiritually naked, to be dressed by God. Not to come to the Lord Lord with our own clothing, our own religion, our own deeds, you know? And and so I would far rather have, have, have seen what happened last night with that, good number of people that we had there at the Bible study to hear that message to be, and I, and I had, I've had messages today from people just saying, you know, what the Lord, you know, did to, to strengthen their faith, uh, last night. And, and, uh, but anyway, um, if other people found that, you know, going and getting ashes on your forehead, and that was a way that you can, um, and, and hearing a message there and that that's your way to draw close to God, more power to any Christian, who chooses either of those, because you're not sinning either way. Um, you're not sinning either way. But it, it, it's important that our heart be in it, that the gospel be in it. And I just know, Son, that uh, we had a celebration of the gospel last night, and um, it, was, it was beautiful. And, and so I just, I just want every Christian to be able to experience that joy of being set free, like the man who wrote to me this past week who had been burdened by this message of lordship salvation. and Boy, you haven't made Jesus Lord enough. You know, you got to do a little bit more. You got to do a little bit more. Then you can maybe know, you know, no, that's, that's not the gospel. Dan Dozell with us, as always, as we talk about, in this particular case, starting off with Lent and what that's about, and then going into some other conversations. And, Dan, we truly appreciate the time that you take to share with us, and we look forward to many more conversations as the, the Lord allows. I sure look forward to that as well, Son. Thank you so much for this uh, just really um, helpful discussion today. And for those of you listening, we thank you for listening. Do tell a friend and uh, let them know. Send them our way. You can send them to uh, RadioWarp.com. That's Radio W-A-R-P dot com for episodes of Sanctified Reason. Then you can just click on the uh, Sanctified Reason um, icon and see all the shows there. So again, thanks for listening. Do tell a friend and until next time, God bless.